Lori Daybell's niece, Melanie Pulowski, took the stand in the Chad Daybell trial, and we're going to talk about some of the highlights from her testimony in today's video. Hello, Sofa Squad, and welcome back to the sofa. Sofa's back here, and as usual, Roscoe is taking a bath. And my name's Paul, and as usual, I'm sitting in front of the sofa. Now, like I said, today we're going to be focusing again on the Chad Daybell trial, and specifically some of the testimony coming out from some of those close to Chad and Lori. Specifically today, we'll be talking about Melanie Pulowski, uh, formerly Melanie Boudreau, and she took the stand. Uh, some interesting things came out, mostly about, to me, what stuck out, but we'll go over it, uh, obviously, in detail, is uh, just some of the relations, some of the teachings, who she heard it from, that type stuff. So, that being said, the way we will do this video is we're just going to actually look at some clips from the trial, I'll talk about them, and then we'll go from there. Now, if you do want to follow Mr. Roscoe and me outside the you, the tubes, we're on the Insta, the gram, the Instagram, it's on the screen, it's in the description, go on, give it a click. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Would you say at some point you developed a close relationship with Chad? Um, yes. At some point, did you eventually begin referring to him as dad? Yes. I'm talking like major cringe in this, okay? Now, remember this. If you're new to the case or whatever, Melanie was very wrapped up with Lori, with Chad, with Alex, with this belief system. She has a couple, she has her own kids. She was married before to Brandon. Brandon had an attempt on his life taken. It was very questionable as to how the, the alleged person who we do believe to be Alex Cox knew where he lived. So my personal opinion is that she was giving information to Lori and they were going to try and take him out. He was going down the same pipeline that Charles Vallow, the children, all this, you know, oh, he's dark, he's this, he's out to get you. There was also, during the case that this came out, some of the body cam footage of police intervening her, trying to get the kids from his parents' house. Uh, custody battle galore, you name it. She was very manic, very sketched out in that, very unwell in my opinion so maybe she has changed i don't know hopefully so for the sake of children okay because this made me very nervous in the beginning where i was like her kids are very lucky to be alive to be quite honest so that's just a very quick synopsis of who she is and how she plays into this um i do not know her personally i do not know she still subscribes to the belief system of Lori and chad uh so there that's that let's continue do you recall what they taught you or told you in relation to light and dark? Um, from what I remember, um, Chad was said to have a gift to spiritually discern, and he could see um, light and dark or if a person um, had good intentions, um, but that he could see through and had that gift. And did you ever learn about him having some kind of a tool or something that he would use to help him discern light and dark? Yes. What did you learn about that? Um, that he had a um, pendant or like necklace, um, something to that effect that he could, um, like a pendulum kind of thing, or he could um, get a, an answer to something he wanted to know. And it looks like, and just for the record, it looks like you were making a swinging motion with your hand. Is that correct? I, that's what I've um, seen from other people that will use like a tool or something like that, that you, I think you swing it. And if it swings one way, it means yes or, or no. I'm not sure exactly. Chad had a damn mood ring. <laughs> That's all that was. He had a damn mood ring talking about I can see the future and through dark souls and stuff. Now, also notice where she's like, oh, he can see through and like see a good intention and all this. Him and Lori have the worst intentions of anyone, right? But, oh, he's going to tell you what your intentions are. The decent people that surrounded them were all evil compared to, compared to the actual evil ones, right? This is what blows my mind. And then all this little stupid, you know, he had a pendulum. He, I mean, cannot roll my eyes hard enough. The fact that they bought into this stuff, the Zulemas, the Melanie Gibbs, the Melanie Pulaski, 
is mind rocking to me, okay? But now that being said, you can also kind of get this, you know, you can see through the veil, I guess, to the little world that they lived in because it was such a, a little world, right? And it was like this, and what we'll hear from her, from specifically Melanie, is some of the things like, oh, well, this is from the scriptures, but this isn't, or this or that, or whatever. You know, what is kind of like authentically, maybe has origins in the scriptures, but then it has been contorted by Lori and Chad, which most of it is, because most people that I talk to or hear from that are of the actual like LDS, Mormon, that kind of thing, they're like, this, the, they're, the, the stuff they're talking about is absolutely not, right? This is like blasphemy, whatever you want to call it. Um, so that part to me was very interesting when we hear these people up here testifying and whatnot. So let's keep going. At some point, did Chad and Lori teach you about castings? Uh, yes. What do you recall them teaching you regarding castings? Um, from the basis of where it comes in the scriptures, where you raise your, actually, I don't even know if that specifically is in the scriptures, but where you raise your right hand and can cast out um, a dark spirit or um, a demon. Um, but they... They would um, explain how to do that um, and the correct correct way to do that or sharing different ideas on how, um, what that could mean. Have you ever seen like the TikToks or Instagram or like little reels or whatever, and they've taken some of those churches where it's like the pastor's going around and healing people. There's one where he has a jacket and he'll like hit people with a jacket in a crowd. And the whole crowd will fall over. This is literally what I envision them doing. And them, you know, Chad, Lori, the Melanie, Zulema, like the whole Alex, the whole little crowd that was like following this round. This whole thing about you raise your right hand, I can just see them all trying to outdo one another, right? Like if they were so, so throwing shade at each other, they'd be like, I'm casting that attitude out, girl. I don't know about that. That zombie attitude, I'm casting that out, girl. Yeah, well, I'm going to cast that out of you. You know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And then Chad in the corner, I cast thy devil out of thy soul, my sweet Melanie. You know what I'm saying? I can just see it now. That's the one thing with the crowd. And again, when I'm saying the crowd, I'm just talking about the ones that were following this. Chad, Lori, Zulema, Alex, Melanie, Melanie. I'm probably leaving others out. Julie's in there, but she's kind of like an offset of this. I mean, she's not offset, but like she's not all up in it like them, right? There's kind of like a little bit of a deviation there with her and the crowd and whatnot. So, but they got a lot of their ideas from her. They grifted a lot of their ideas from Julie. You know, but the whole crowd that just followed this, it was like they're so eager to one-up each other, to be seen, to be heard, to be special, right? And that's probably very intoxicating. Who doesn't want to be special? Who doesn't want to be seen and heard and feel like they made an impact? Well, at this point, it's like they're being told, you're, you're going to be here for the second coming, right? You're going to be the temple. You're going to be this. You're going to be that. You know, you have the power to do your little casting outs. I mean, this could be very intoxicating to people who might like aren't, how should I say it, well aligned. And did they teach you who castings would be done on or for? Um, yes. And who, who were those individuals? Um, that you could do, um, you could cast out at any time um, for anybody if you feel like you're being inflicted with um, some type of um, dark spirit or a bad feeling that anybody at any time could raise the right hand to the square and cast out. I cast out these bills. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine? So much of it, I mean, again, I always go back to this question where I'm like, did they really believe this stuff? And I think that each to their own was probably out for themselves and trying to prove whatever they were. So they probably didn't believe it because I mean, let's be honest, you're going to be able to tell if it works or not. But they were so eager trying to impress one another that they just went along with it. It was almost like this group, like what do you call it? Like group think or like where a group influences one another. I don't know what the like psychological term for that is, but uh, like that, you know, like a pissing contest in layman's terms. Okay. 
<laughs> like a literal pissing contest with each other to see who could outdo spiritually the next person. You, know, you heard this in the phone call, well, most any of their conversations, but especially this was prevalent in the phone call between Melanie Gibb and Lori Daybell, when Melanie is obviously trying to set them up and get information, and they have this like spiritual rap battle with one another. And the cringe is so painful because they are so eager to teach one another and the world about these lessons, but yet they are absolutely lost, broken individuals. Like anyone in a five minute conversation with these people can immediately tell this person is broken, right? Like that has these, like this coming at you in this direction, and they are the last person that, ab that ever needs to be schooling others. But I digress. Let's go to the next clip. And you said it was done on Charles? Yes. Had you been told anything in relation to Charles being dark at that point? I think at that time they believed, and they, Lori and Chad, believed Charles was affected by some type of dark spirit. Now, if I'm correct, that spirit's name was named Ned. And when she says they, trust me when I tell you there was others that went along with this. Now, what she might be referring to as well is like they came up with an idea, which is typically how this sounds like it goes. Someone would get in the way of something they wanted, and then said person would mysteriously become evil, a zombie, a dark uh, person on the Richter scale, however you call that, um, moving away from being a light being or whatever that kind of entity and they would need to go now again we're going to hear in a minute where it's like well if somebody's soul is infected enough like their body will die so sometimes castings just aren't enough like for example if somebody's evil but they also have a bank account that you need to get to well probably most likely with this crowd that person's going to end up dying okay it's just very convenient how they operate did you ever learn anything in relation to Tylee being labeled as dark? Yes. And what did you learn in relation to that? That I believe Chad labeled her as, as dark. And do you know who it was that labeled JJ as dark? I assume that it was Chad. Again, notice his kids weren't that way. Only Lori's, okay? Now, again, I will say this. I'm sure Lori gassed him up because, remember, Lori is severely bitter over the fact that Kay got the money for JJ, the money that was the insurance policy, all that kind of stuff left that uh, Charles switched from Lori to Kay. That's his sister. Um, because he saw the ride on the wall. He was going to cops and all this. Nobody was listening to him. And then what, what he said was going to happen, happened. He was murdered by this evil group of people and there was that and so he wanted Kay to take care of JJ and that's where I do believe on that one specifically uh, now I'm sure Lori helped out gassing and other things up but I think that JJ was a huge revenge thing for Lori as well to get back at Kay like that level of bitterness and I also just think that once she met Chad she was over like being the mom thing she's like no these kids are just my way. JJ had, you know, JJ is all over the place. He requires all this attention, and Kay got the money, and she, you know, loves him. So I'll get back at her that way. J or Ty Lee, she's just in my way, you know, being a teenager, whatever. You know, I just, I think it was that simple with them. Um, sorry, could you say it again? Do you know where the idea of casting at how Lori and Chad were teaching it, where it originated from, or who with whom? Um, from what I remember, their teachings and their ideas were constantly changing, but I believe the original idea came from uh, the Julie Rowe podcasts where she would teach how to cast out and she had a, um, like a long way of doing that. And then I think um, they kind of both, and Chad and Lori, when I say both, um, kind of added their own ideas um, to that. Again, Julie Rowe. Now, she got caught, I believe, trying to sneak into court with a hat on. and She's on the witness list, which should be very interesting. Oh, my God. Um, she, again, not that I'm defending her, but Chad literally grifted so many of his ideas from her. He saw that her grift was working, and he wanted some of it. Now, you heard Melanie say, well, I think they put their own little spin on it. And that's what they did. They did this with, the, with their original religion that they started off with. This is why Heather Daybell saw this coming. She called it out. She was like, they are coming. They are going to be going to our church and grifting people. Because all they're doing is taking like a kernel of truth of something that they've learned and manipulating that 
into their own belief system that's very self-serving. Very self-serving. So this whole thing of like, oh, I think Chad did it. Chad ripped off Julie. That's literally what it comes And anyone else he could. If he liked your idea, he was going to rip it off. Now, I get, here's the thing. Yeah, we're not going to sit here and gatekeep somebody had this idea so they can only have it. I get that, right? I'm not trying to say that. But once you see the context and the meaning behind what he was doing with this, which was completely self-serving, and then obviously where it ended up and this, you know, so many people lost their lives, that's where it just comes down to, and especially because it's Chad, it's like this guy doesn't even have an original thought. He's supposed to be some self, you know, proclaimed prophet, and he doesn't even have an original thought. Did at some point did you speak with Lori about Charles' death? Ah, uh, yes. What do you recall? What she told you regarding Charles' death? Yes, I remember. Um, I went to her home, and her and Tylee uh, were still shooken up from it. But they explained that there was some type of um, fight that my uncle Alex got into with Charles, and that Alex shot Charles. AKA he was ambushed and killed. Okay. That's all that came down to. Okay. He was ambushed. They knew exactly what they were doing. That's why Alex was there doing the dirty work. We've heard in other testimony, Alex was the protector. Alex was this. She knew she being Lori, Chad by proxy, they could get Alex to do the majority of the dirty work. There is this very odd relationship between he and Lori. Now, I, whether it's come out and stand or not, and we'll hear from Melanie where she's like, I didn't see anything weird between Alex and Lori, but like childhood type stuff, whatever, they had an odd relationship. Like just odd, okay? Like just almost like kind of uncomfortably close for brother or sister type thing. Um, and I think that Lori manipulated him with that. She knew how to turn on whatever you want to call it, her charm or whatever to um to get men to do what they wanted and i think alex was just one of those men to her when you went to missouri was tylee with you no was jj with you no did you ask Lori where they were yes what did she tell you i think she said that the nanny was helping with jj and i don't think tylee at the time needed um like a babysitter she was old enough to um to kind of be independent or maybe it could have been too that tylee was helping with jj i can't remember exactly mm -hmm. yeah okay here's the thing that's never set right with me there's numerous things that have never set right with me with melanie palowski um number one this right here so close with all of them and all that never question where her little cousins are though never questioned it oh they're not here well i questioned it but was given oh well they're here Okay, now we'll hear further information on the stand-up. Well, yeah, she was on the phone, but I couldn't hear what she was saying. She had the ear thing in a lot of times and this and that. Again, every family's different. I'm not trying to sit here and say I know what someone's experience would be like, okay? Um, because I can look at my scenario with different cousins that I have and be like, if I was in this situation with them and I didn't see their kid, at this point it would be weird to me. You know what I mean? Like in any kind of interaction, like, well, how are they or... You know, or putting them on the phone, like, hey, you know, Paul says, hey, that kind of, like, if you're around them, you know what I'm saying? So, but again, every family's different. Every person's different. I get my experience is not that, okay? So, I'll give her that. Obviously, I've already discussed some of my other things. The fact that her ex-husband was almost killed. You know, the fact that she acted like, huh, what are you talking about? The fact that she was able to scurry around so much of this. I honestly was shocked she was never charged with something that she was able to get out of whatever you know maybe her hands weren't directly on something like dirty or whatever but i felt like they were right around there on several things and that's always set wrong with me with melanie was jj with you in hawaii no was tylee with you in hawaii no did you ask Lori where they were i believe i did i probably would have yes and do you recall what she indicated to you I don't. Probably one of the same answers she had been Judge, making. I'm going to move for objection, speculation. She answered the question. It's sustained. Did you ever hear Lori on the phone with JJ or Tylee while you, while you were in Hawaii? No. Did you hear her on the phone with Chad Daybell? I heard her on the phone, but she would put headphones in, so I never knew who she was talking to. Okay. So, here we are. Another place. Kids aren't there. Did you, did you ask where they were? I think I would have. You wouldn't remember that. 
Okay, period, end of story. You would remember that. I, I think I would have, she probably said the same thing, and that's not weird at this point. You know, did you ever hear on the phone? No. Did you hear on the phone with Chad? Yeah, but she had those ear things on. Uh, again, think in the context of most anyone you know that has kids. A couple of different times you've been around, the kids aren't around. Now, the one in college, so Tylee, it's a little more believable. But also think of how odd is it to not see the parent interact with said child at all. This is not even bringing into context in that theory or idea of, J of JJ, the younger one, who would, you would expect, have more of a interaction than like a teenage counterpart sibling. You know what I mean? Um completely bizarre and one thing that i think benefited melanie to get out of trouble and like avoid it was almost like i have blinders on i'm not asking where the children are see no evil hear no evil that type thing right because it's as weird as it is it's almost like she just kept her head down and didn't ask questions did chad and Lori ever share with you what they believed their mission in this world to be um i believe it was um to help with the second coming of Jesus Christ. I mean, my God, if this cup said can't roll my eyes hard enough, I'd be drinking from it. It's in the dishwasher right now. It's the self-importance for me. Okay, we're talking severe egomaniacs here, right? I mean, major egomaniacs. Disgusting egomaniacs, okay? <laughs> that part right there, how, how highly they thought of themselves and how low they thought of everyone else around them. At some point, did you learn a different term for people that were possessed? Yes. And what was that term? Um, zombie. Do you recall who introduced that term to you? Um, I believe it was Lori. At what point do you jump off this crazy train? Talking about zombies, talking about this, talking about casting out, talking about bodies dying, talking about can't find the kids. At what point do you jump off the crazy train? Because there's so many things that I'm like, wh why were we still on the ride? We still stayed on the ride after zombies. We still stayed on the ride after that. You see what I'm saying? Like, huh? Like, no. And I get you don't want to sit here. It's different when you are being like slowly integrated into all this stuff and whatnot. All those things seem to move pretty quickly with this crowd. You know, I get that part. And I get that it's your family, all that. But again, there's just a certain level where it's like back away. If someone became too dark, would the body have to die? Judge leading. Overruled. Um, I, I believe so. That I think that was their idea that the, they would pass away because they couldn't um, have this darkness inside them. Mm, how convenient. That part right there... And again, like when you listen to other testimony, like with Melanie Gibb, uh, whether it was in this trial or the chat, or I'm sorry, Lori's, you know, talking about, well, it wasn't like a, it was like a more like a metaphor type thing or whatever. And I'm like, uh -huh. okay. You know, but again, y'all are grown adults with kids and families and stuff. And you're over here talking about this Dungeons and Dragons stuff. And I'm not trying to shame Dungeons and Dragons at all because I like that game when I was growing up, okay? But I'm talking about like when you start applying fantasy to real life and acting out on it, that's an issue, okay? That's an issue. And that's what they did here. And obviously they were using it as an excuse and as a shield to commit murder and all sorts of financial crimes and all sorts of other stuff hiding behind that they were supposed to be here for the second coming of Christ. I cannot take it. Let's keep going. When law enforcement were looking for the children, did you observe anything about how Alex seemed to feel about that or behave? He seemed calm and normal. Um, just collected his normal self. Just another day at the office. That's what's frightening. Yeah, you know, when we look at those pictures, the last pictures of them when they were at the uh, state park, and I cannot remember right now. I don't know if it was Yosemite. I cannot remember. It wasn't Yosemite. Um, I can't remember the name of it right now off the top of my head. But the the pictures, if you followed the case, you know what I'm talking about. You know, and I'm just like, did they know what they were doing? I think it was like a send off thing. I think it was like a send off thing for them. And it was like, okay, this is it. Here we go. We're going to start with this plan. We're going to have this one last kind of moment. And you look at Alex and it's like, how could, how could any of them really, but because he had his hands on it so much, 
that's the part that you're just like, how could you do this to your little niece and nephew? And then just act like, hmm, you know, and then we hear testimony from others that it's like, you know, oh yeah, he believed a hundred percent. I believe that was Melanie Gibb where she was like, you know, Alex, the zombies believe this hundred percent, hundred percent. This stuff's real. Okay. You know, okay. Did you ever talk to Chad about concerns you had regarding tracking devices? Yes. What do you recall about that? Um, Chad reached out um, and told me that my ex-husband uh, was following me and had put a tracking device on my car. Did that turn out to be true? Yes. Did that make you trust him more? Chad? Yes. It validated a lot of the things he was saying, for me at least. Very, you see how Chad operates. So that gained the trust even more. See, see my sweet Melanie, he's following you. It's like, yeah, probably concerned about the kids. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Probably concerned about himself, what's going on. I mean, this is the thing you gotta remember, like all of a sudden they're just like waking up and have this completely different life. You know what I mean? It's like, bam, we're all into this, this whatever you want to call this, you know, and people are dying, people are missing, marriages are ending, all this crazy stuff, you know, and then they are dumbfounded that their spouses are nervous about it. And when we talk about the light and dark, would you ask Lori to get the answers from chat on that if someone was light or dark? Yes. And did you ever learn anything in relation? And again, did you learn whether or not Charles was designated as dark? Uh, yes. And was he designated as dark? I believe so, yes. Is Charles still alive? No. Now, this is very powerful what she does here, where she asks this whole thing about light, dark, this and the other, and are they still alive? One thing that Pryor will try to do, and I get it, he's a defense attorney, and this is a good point, where he's like, did you hear this from lawyer Chad? Lori, so you never heard these words from Chad, right? And technically, Pryor has a point, but it's very slippery because it's almost like this is Lori. Hello? Yes. Oh, yes. I've been referring to my mood ring all day long, but let me go see the, on the light and dark scale where your ex-husband Brandon is today. I'm going to go consult with Chad and be right back. You see what I'm saying? So technically, when Melanie said, well, yeah, it's Lori that said it, but with a caveat. <laughs> um, so you see where it's going. So prior, excellent point on Pryor's part for bringing that up, but you see what they're doing. They're shooting it down. So they're making also the correlation. So everyone that was deemed dark is dead, right? Pretty much. Was JJ designated as dark? I believe so, yes. Judge, this is going beyond the scope of cross. Your Honor, oh. is JJ still alive? No. Was Tylee labeled as dark? Yes. Is Tylee still alive? No. I have no further questions. All right. Thank you, Ms. Blake. That was a damn drop the damn mic moment right there from Ms. Blake. She's had several of them. Um... You know, and I saw Carrie, Carrie, I keep calling when I go to say Kay, Kay and Larry, I go Carrie. <laughs> so I was, I was, I've, I've joined them as just one force, right? I know that that's a bad thing, right? So like hashtag Carrie, Carrie strong, right? So I saw an interview with Kay and Larry there. I got it out. And she's like, he's going to get the death penalty. You know what I mean? Like, pff, I mean, come come on, right? <laughs> you know, I just love her for that. I love her for many different things in this case that we've learned of her, right? Uh, and Larry as well. I'm not excluding him from that. Uh, but she was just so real for that. Because I was like, hey, man, girl. <laughs> I mean, seriously. You know, and Chad has to be. I don't know if it, uh, and you help me out in the comment section, I don't know if a plea was offered and he just didn't take it. Yeah, you know, because I'm sitting here thinking this, I'm like, dude, you saw what happened to Lori. You know what I mean? Like, you you should know. The only reason she's not sitting on Old Sparky is because they were able to sit here and get all tricky. You know, but the fact that you took this to trial on an Old Sparky charge for this, with those pictures that people had to look at of those poor children and the condition of them, but I should say what was left of them in his backyard and you took it to trial. Okay. 
I mean, but again, it's almost like, but maybe he wanted to. Because sometimes you have to think about these these offenders who go to trial with some of these things where it's so obvious. It's so obvious that there's no way they can get out of it. Although you say that and you think of stuff like Casey Anthony, but regardless. You know, but it's so obvious that it's like, there's just absolutely no way. And it's like, well, what were you thinking? It's like, well, maybe they didn't want to take their own life and this is the way to do that. Mind you, it will take decades to get there if it even actually reaches that. So, you know, there's that. But again, my vibe off of like reading between the lines, and again, I don't know these people. I am not an officer, a psychologist, any of that stuff. But listening to Melanie, there's a few moments where I still just felt like she had this thing. She's been a very perplexing figure in this case to me because again, like I said, I think that she's very lucky by like a hair of a fraction that she's not up here being charged with something. You know, I think she was right there with it and I think somehow, some way, they either protected her or like let her only know so much information to where she technically wasn't involved in this side of the other type thing. And obviously they didn't have time to get to her children. They tried to get to Brandon, right? That didn't work. Um, you know, and then Ian, which we're going to hear, we'll go over his stuff next, um, because that's her, her husband. And remember, they got married, like, was super quick. And then during this, it's like, oh, yeah, and by the way, all the stuff's going on. He does a wiretap. I mean, crazy stuff, right? So this is how that relationship enters. So I just feel like, with you know, given her history, given her, you know, all this kind of stuff that there's probably still a little bit of a foot in this now she will make reference that at the time i believed you know kind of differentiating that and maybe hopefully i pray she has opened her eyes and realized this stuff from your aunt and chad is not it okay go find a religion go whatever you got to do to get through the day but this right here is not it and this whole thing about everyone's out to get me, it's just, again, it's, you know, de-brainwash yourself and move forward. I'm glad she got up here and presented information and testified and all that. I mean, she probably didn't have a choice, right? Um, so there's that. And again, I hope that she moves past this and sees, oh, whoa, that was crazy. I don't ever need to go down that path again, you know, uh, for the sake of those around her. So anyways, let me know. What do you think? What was your most interesting part or takeaway from her testimony. I want to know. Roscoe wants to know and he also wants to know that you'll drop some sofas off in the comment section so that we have a little place to sit and talk about Melanie, Ian, Zulema, this case, all the other stuff we talk about here at the Sofa Squad. And until he and I do meander our way down there, we'll see y'all soon. I just wanted to say thank you again for watching the whole video and also thank you for being part of the Sofa Squad. Special thanks to all the Patreon members, channel members from both of my channels, everybody who likes, shares, subscribes, comments in the comment sections. It helps the channel out so much. Now, don't forget, I do have that other channel, the podcast channel. That's where we go live. We hang out. We talk. Uh, we have kind of sort of a schedule, but just be sure and check it out. I'll put it up here on the screen. Also, if you're looking for merch, be sure to check out my Teespring store. I'll put that up here. And then, like I said in the beginning of the video, if you want to follow me and Roscoe on the Insta, on the gram, on the Instagram, go on, check it out. It's right here on the screen again. But once again, thank you very much. I really appreciate you being part of the Sofa Squad, and I'll See you in the next video.